Start the sequence. We've got activity on the hotline. They've had their chance. No, no, somebody's talking to the Kremlin. That's a clip from, well, I don't know, wait a minute. Does it even matter? I mean, I think that's the sum of all fears, but doesn't even matter. It's just some other phony, baloney, orchestrated intelligence, community, propaganda, psyop, major motion picture bullshit. And I guess if you're uncomfortable with that idea, if you're uncomfortable with the idea that you're being constantly played, manipulated by some parapolitical psyop machine that we can't even begin to wrap our head around, then you might have a hard time with today's interview with the Recluse. Here's a clip. I want people to understand the techniques, especially in terms of psychological operations that are being used. I mean, not just so you can recognize them, but so you can learn how to use them yourself. Because I mean, effectively, if we are going to have a third position or we are simply going to try to sway one of the two dominant positions in a more, just say, humanitarian direction, <laughs> what they're currently geared towards, we have to understand their techniques and their methods. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sikaris, and today we welcome Stephen Snyder, aka Recluse, to Skeptico. Recluse is the author of a new book I have up on the screen if you're watching, A Special Relationship, Trump, Epstein, and the secret and the secret history of the Anglo-American establishment. I also wanted to mention another great book that Stephen did along with his co-host, co-creator of the excellent The Farm podcast. And that is a book titled Strange Tales of the Parapolitical, Post-War Nazis, Mercenaries, and other secret history. You can find that book on Amazon, but the other place and the real place to go to find that and the new book that's coming out is the VISIP blog that uh, Recluse does. And you can go right there to the store and it's better for him. I mean, he gets a little bit more out of it, which we definitely want when you're doing your own books like that. So, if you're unfamiliar with his work, uh, oh, you're in for a real treat. I mean, Recluse is very much of a deep dive kind of guy. Tons of research backed up with tons of really solid references. And a lot of, if only things were that simple kind of insights, which I, I love because that's kind of this level three kind of stuff. It's never simple. It's never one way. So it, it's going to be great fun for me. I've been really looking forward to this one. Recluse, man, welcome to Skeptico. Thanks so much for joining me. Yeah, well, thanks for having me on, Alex. So you know what I thought we'd do is just uh, jump in. Why don't you give folks a quick scan overview of those two books, because what I'm really hoping to do is kind of stitch some of, stitch some of this stuff together, particularly as it's relating to the craziness that is unfolding on a daily basis. And I love how you're pulling the lens back to this parapolitical perspective that is a little bit removed from the normal kind of conspiracy theory perspective, but is absolutely essential to understanding any of this. So with that kind of lens that I've already applied to the thing, tell us about uh, the, these two books that people might be interested in. Well, the first one, Strange Tales, was uh, kind of an anthology. It was a collection of essays that uh, myself and Frank Zero had written. Frank did like the introduction and I think the, uh, was it the RFID chip one. Uh, and then I did three myself. One of them was on the uh, you know famous or infamous depending on one's uh, point of view, Mellon family of Pittsburgh. Uh, they've certainly been involved in a lot of intrigues. Uh, a very wealthy family, of course. Thomas Mellon was the infamous uh, Secretary of the Treasury during uh, the 1920s, leading up to the. Can, great can I just interject? I just want to make sure you hit the high levels for, because you know, for folks who are coming at this cold parapolitical 
is really, really interesting in terms of where you're taking that. I mean, maybe break it down at that basic of a level of what does parapolitical mean to you? And why would kind of most people that run across would go, oh, he's just a conspiracy, conspiracy theory guy. And well, yeah, yeah. Well, that's actually what we're trying to like get away from, essentially. I mean, parapolitical was essentially an attempt to do a more of a scholarly approach to deep politics. I mean, it would be a field that was uh, really pioneered, I think, uh, going into the 70s by researchers like Peter Dale Scott or uh, Albert McCoy. And, uh, you know, you can sort of see the lineage going on with people like Douglas Valentine, with the great Jeffrey Bale, those types of people. But essentially, I mean, it was where you were actually doing your research, you know. I mean, one of the things that I've learned from doing this about 10, you know, for 10 years or so now that I mean, the really, the great stories and the really true stories are not the ones that you're going to find necessarily online and YouTube videos or even in books, frankly. I mean, there are going to be in private papers that are stashed away at all these different universities across the country. They're going to be in personal interviews with some of these characters. But I mean, that's where you find the stuff that nobody's ever really heard of before. And that's really, to me, the essence of true research. I mean, it's not just, you know, looking at some of the, you know, time-worn tropes of conspiracy culture, like the whole of Carol Horse and using that as a citation over and over again. It's doing a le legitimate and original research to try to bring new perspectives into a lot of these topics. And that, to me, is what differentiates parapolitics from conspiracy theory. You know, I absolutely agree with you. But I'd, I'd add something else, because I think there's so much more to what... Uh, you're doing here in the, I don't know, maybe so much more is maybe a little bit too much, but just to me, there's a, a lens focus kind of shift in that we live, I, I think we've, we've now adapted to the parapolitical culture that we live in. You know, I'm an older guy than you are. So I remember back, you know, the JFK assassination, we ground on that, you know, all the books and the doubts and all that stuff for years and years and years. JFK is parapolitical. It always was parapolitical, but we never had that lens. So I think then we lived through that and we got into this conspiracy, you know, famous Bush up there kind of laying out the word, you know, don't believe these conspiracy kind of things. And we shifted. And I think what you're doing is bringing that shift back and saying, you know, really, this is the only way to look at any of this stuff is through this parapolitical, and you're living in a parapolitical world. That's what I see you saying. So to me, it's not even so much that we have to uh, throw things away because they're too conspiratorial or they're citing the same references over and over again. To me, what you're really doing is a lens change and saying, wait, all this stuff that you think is real, is really parapolitical. It's social engineering. It's mind games. It's all this psyop kind of stuff. What do you think about that lens shift kind of thing? Well, I mean, certainly, I think in my case, really, that's what I've been trying to do a lot. I mean, especially relatively recently and trying to actually look more at um, conspiracy culture itself. Because, I mean, it's very much a part of all of this. I mean, as much as anything. And, I mean, it's really been instrumental, I think, in fragmenting the worldview of civilization as a whole, uh, you know, which we're definitely living in right now very much. Uh, it's, you know, it's frankly been terrible consequences in that sense. And that's one of the reasons why I've been trying to put such an emphasis on that, because I want people to understand how all these psychological warfare operations, you know, function and how they affect us and how they affect the different narratives that shape our reality, essentially. That's a great point. And, and with that, maybe I, I'd bring you back to this, this book, The Strange Tares, Tales of the Parapolitical, because one of the things you do in there, and, and, and it's kind of an interesting contrast to the Epstein book, because the new Epstein book, which, you know, we're recording this October 23rd, and that is supposed to drop, and people can find it on your website, like when in a week or two kind of thing yes yeah. yes hopefully within the next week or two but uh, well, we're definitely sure to get it out before the election <laughs> yeah that, that would be that would be a must but the interesting thing i find between these two books is if there are these lingering doubts among people the advantage of the strange tales of the parapolitical is that it isn't rolling out in real time. Like the Epstein book, you know, even though you're going back and tracing the history of it, 
back to the 60s and even before that, it, it's rolling in real time. I mean, Maxwell's still in prison, you know, yeah. but that thing hasn't been resolved. This one, because you look at like post-war Nazis down in South America and all the shenanigans they played clearly with the CIA, we have a little bit of a, of a historical distance from it. And when you start laying out the evidence, which is undeniable, I think it's, it, 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 it's kind of harder for people to reject that, the premise of it, that this is what's in play and this is how you have to look at this stuff. Compared to, like I say, the new book, Epstein, we have lived through it, but I think we're still kind of in shock about Yeah. Well, that was, you know, one of the reasons, too, why I did try to uh, focus essentially so much on that whole period between the 1930s and the 1960s, where, you know, sort of the genesis of Epstein's network came from in the first book, because, I mean, that is something that we do have a certain advantage of time that's passed, and there has been a lot of different works now that have been published, especially in regards to Perfumo, because that's, it's such an enigmatic scandal. It's really very much like the UK's JFK assassination. It's never really been satisfactory explained, and now we do have those so many different testimonies regarding it, so you do have a certain advantage in reconstructing events now. Tell people the basics on that, and then I think they'll see the links, but then the links to how it goes all the way forward to what we're living in now. Well, Perfumo was a scandal that broke out in 1963. It had its origins, though, about two years earlier in 61. And it basically involved a love triangle uh, involving a woman named Christine Keeler, who was having an affair with um, John Perfumo, who was a member of uh, Harold Macmillan, the prime minister's cabinet, and um, Yuri Ivanov, who was a Soviet naval attache there and also a GRU agent on the side, which is uh, Russia's um, still actually their principal military intelligence division. And um, obviously this created some issues. You now essentially had a prominent British official who was having an affair with a woman who was also sleeping with a uh, you know, Soviet spy effectively. But um, you know, kind of further mudding the waters is Christine was essentially one of the girls for this guy called Stephen Ward, a so-called society osteopath, who was well-connected throughout the British establishment and a lot of the Americans who were over there as well. And that just goes into an incredible world of these just strange doings with the, uh, you know, VIP sex rings. I mean, you see just all these incredible things. I mean, some of this weird, you know, occult stuff, frankly. Uh, I mean, the indications that there were minors involved in some of this. But I mean, it just brings up so many different levels. And effectively, this, you know, was instrumental in bringing down Harold Macmillan's government in 1963 in the UK when the scandal started to break. And then also, I think it played a pretty crucial role in the Kennedy assassination over here as well. And that's also kind of another angle, too, that, I mean, Americans who have looked at the Kennedy assassination haven't really paid as much attention to as they probably should have. And that was the role of foreign governments in it as well. Um, certainly, I do think you can look at elements of the UK being involved, probably the Israelis as well, and so forth. But I mean, that's kind of like the same thing you're getting at with like, uh, you know, the uh, essay I did in Colonia Dignidad, for instance, in Strange Tales. It's like, Colonia Dignidad, it's just, it's so weird. It almost doesn't seem like a place like that could even exist in the real world. Again, Recluse, back up and, and talk about that for people who, who are coming at it cold. There's also okay. a great, Netflix doesn't have a ton of great stuff. I know, it, I know. It I still know. has that great documentary, doesn't it? That, or not a documentary, it's actually a movie uh, called Colonnade. Yes, yes, Colony, yeah. yes, yes, yes. That was actually yeah. a pretty good one, too, recounting of it. But um, yeah, it was essentially set up around uh, 1959, 1960, thereabouts, Colonia uh, Dignidad, um, by, what was his name, Paul Schaefer who uh, had been some member of the uh, Nazi party at some point. Uh, he ended up at setting up essentially this compound in Chile. Uh, it was a massive place, I think around three or 400 acres in its heyday. Essentially, you had a whole German community that was living there. Um, they almost had all had immigrated over with Schaefer in the early 60s. Uh, they had, you know, they were segregated by the sexes into compounds. They worked 14 hour days. They had these confessional periods that were kind of like quiet time with the moral rearmament movement or what's not, that type of thing. It was a cult, which is like key. But the, the other thing about it is it, it kind of provides, again, this lens on what the Nazis were really all about in that we sometimes forget. It was about total societal uh, control and, 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 engineering, you know, at that cult level, at that deep psychological level, probably at a, an occult level, 
And then certainly in terms of uh, traumatizing people with sex and violence and everything else, I mean, it had all the, all the buttons. And then, you know, of course, the tieback that you do in parapolitical is we had absolutely, we as in the United States government, had absolutely no problem partnering with these people, learning from these people, going, oh, wow, that's a good one. How can we, uh, how can we learn for, at your footstep? Oh, and how can we bring you in to do our projects here or do our projects abroad? And that raises all sorts of questions, not just from a parapolitical standpoint, but also, you know, as we'll get into later, from a more deep, you know, spiritual kind of what should we be doing that is good and wh where should we draw the line between what's good and bad and moral. So I, I think, you know, all these points that you're raising, and that's why I said this is so deep to get into, are all jumping off points for some really, really big questions. Any thoughts on, on that linkage? I mean, really, you know, getting into just the whole, uh, the Cold War era, I mean, really, uh, and this is something, again, that I mean, a lot of people don't realize, but there really was just this fascination with using these different kinds of cults and cult ideologies to advance U.S. policy objectives abroad. And um, I mean, you know, you would reach into the Nazi uh, regime for this type of thing, but I mean, it was much more universal, honestly, than that. I mean, one of the more notorious ones that we've looked at on the farm recently was uh, the Unification Church. And I mean, you know, again, this is another outfit that had all the textbook hallmarks of cult control. I mean, when you really study these things, it's just amazing. I mean, how many of these techniques you see over and over again? I mean, the 14 hour work days, segregations, sexes, confessionals, public shaming and humiliations and whatnot. Uh, and it's all rolled out going into the Cold War with different groups. Some of them have been around like moral rearmament. You had people like the Moonies, you had places like Colonia Dignidad, possibly Scientology. There's been a lot of rumors about that for years. I don't know how true it is at this point or not, but you know, there are some interesting uh, speculations on that. But I mean, this really was the kind of thing that we embraced, you know, nominally to defeat communism, whether or not that's purpose is debatable, but that's what we gave as the reason for it. And yeah, I mean, it did have a profound effect on our society because you really were empowering a lot of these just terrible and fringe ideologies. And a lot of this stuff has crept into society at a more broader level at this point. Um, you know, that was something, uh, you know, with the Moonies, I hadn't even really thought of. But I mean, my friend Keith had pointed out on our podcast, I mean, everything from like Taekwondo to sushi. I mean, you know where I want to tie this back because it ties directly back to the presentation you recently did on uh, what was the the title of the conspiranormal uh, kind of uh, conference that you guys did, the virtual conference, and you gave a presentation on MK Ultra and uh, cybernetics, which I thought was fantastic. And again, tied these pieces together in terms of how the mind control agenda that we were keen on doing just kind of ran wild. And it was, that's what I think you're alluding to here. It's like, hey, Unification Church, Moonies, great. What are they doing? How can we do, how can we profit from what they're learning? Oh, it's abusive to people. It's destroying people's lives. Ah, don't worry about that. Maybe we can sprinkle it over here, weaponize it over here and do a little bit. But uh, I don't want to shift gears too much and bounce all over the place, but maybe tell us, because we've talked about MKUltra quite a bit on this show, how that also has the same pathway into this, because that's when I think you, you were alluding to that, right? In your presentation. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean, the presentation I was doing was called Among the Cybermen, uh, essentially the secret history of conspiratainment. But yeah, I mean, a lot of this stuff sort of went back to um, the initial Macy's conference that was done in 1942, I believe, which was sponsored by the Macy Foundation, uh, which incidentally also later became a major funding conduit of MK Ultra. later. But you brought together a lot of these prominent scientists, psychologists, this type of thing. And this is uh, really what produced the whole discipline of cybernetics, which, you know, as I essentially argued in the presentation, Cybernetics is a very esoteric, I mean, almost occultic ideology. I feel like it was essentially a way, much like Jungian psychology, that was devised to rationalize really a lot of what were effectively occult doctrines and kind of apply some kind of scientific jargon to it so that you could get funding for this kind of stuff on a level that was really unprecedented in human history up to that point. 
as you point out, Recluse, it's it's not even like a leap there. I mean, you got you got references where they were doing occult practices. They were doing, and when we say occult practices, I mean they were trying to summon entities in order to see if they could affect these different things. It isn't like obscure. I mean, it it, it is. You know, um, let's nail nail that down for us again, because I'm kind of vague on the details. But I remember I was stunned when with the stuff that you had there. Well, I mean, really, a lot of I, I mean, really, a crucial thing I think to all this is synchronicity. Of course, that was a big concept in Jungian psychology. But I also think cybernetics was essentially trying to come up with a way of uh, explaining this as well through the different orders of cybernetics and so forth. But in cybernetics, okay essentially all of the universe and the different subsections of it are constructed by feedback and these different loops and so forth so there's positive feedback there's negative feedback negative feedback being system sustaining positive feedback being chaotic law of attraction right yes well that's yeah it really is very much an explanation of the law of attractions essentially the secret any of that kind of stuff but yes every thought every action creates different feedback loops and they all bounce off of one another and so forth and that's what creates these systems and then of course you go through the different orders of cybernetics until you get to the mysterious third order of cybernetics and this is when you notice the system and the system notices you noticing the system and in theory, in some of these more arcane interpretations of it, this is what would produce a lot of effects of high strangeness. This is when you would start having the poltergeist activities and the UFOs and all that other crazy stuff, the mechanical elves, whatever you want to say. But I mean, that's when things start getting really weird. And, you know, it's my belief that essentially uh, this was really what MK Ultra was devised to explain, essentially, these different kinds of cybernetic principles, uh, also Jungian psychology and so forth and how effectively all of these things affect reality itself, more or less. Um, but just to be clear where I was going, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but so that's your setup, if you will. That's your, uh, your orientation intellectually, academically, that's what you're saying in your reports to your superiors as you're doing this. But then when a guy walks in and says, hey, I'm a chaos magician, I'm a wizard, I'm a whatever I call myself, I'm Wicca, whatever, and I can make that happen. I can manifest this or that inside of the framework that you've established. Well, you can see where someone would be, well, God, I've kind of already opened, opened myself up to wanting to look at that, so let's see if you can play my game. And if you can, then, you know, I'm in. I mean, this is a, a men who stare at goats kind of thing, you know, where... Oh, yeah. I mean, absolutely. But I mean, also, though, there is that sort of connection as well that magic has essentially to uh, public relations, uh, which was dealt with in what was in Eros and magic and Renaissance and um, psychological warfare, for that matter, too, which is another reason why it would have been so fascinating to people involved in this. I mean, you know, just look at um, the Rastacrucian manifestos, okay? Basically, they were a lark. You know, I mean, they came out in, what, 1610, 1614, or something like that, talking about this great fraternal brotherhood, this secret society. None of it existed. None of it. But then suddenly you have this whole occult, you know, renaissance. Now, I mean, you've got masons and all these secret orders everywhere. And that, in essence, is a magical working, because you manifested something that did not exist previously. And you did it through these, you know, these documents, which were basically LARPs. Well, so, I mean, that, here, here's, the, here's the rub. And, and again, I, I hope anyone can follow this conversation because we're going to bounce all over the place. But it, one of the, <laughs> the central questions for me there is, is there this co-creator of our reality thing? So, you know, you kind of played it really straight there in saying they, it was a LARP and then they created it by these documents. I might open it up and say, did they create it by the documents or did they create it by the collective consciousness of believing it's so? And is this kind of a tulpa, you know, if you're familiar with the Buddhist, Tibetan Buddhist concept of, you know, this thought creation kind of thing, which to me just seems obvious. We see it over and over again, especially in this extended realm where people are contacting spirit entities and they're manifesting spirit entities that don't even exist and yet these spirit entities are coming back and now they do exist you know we we did 
I did a bunch of interviews on this evil thing. And you look at Satan, that is Satan. Because you look all the way back, you know, in the, the, the Jews and the oldest writings, they don't have Satan. And then Zoriaster comes along and, and he, you know, kind of has this good, bad, you know, kind of thing. Saying, Next thing you know, the same stories <laughs> that were in the old Torah, you know, now they're showing up again. And now a character, a new character has been written into it. But would anyone at this, so it's, it's obviously literature to some degree, but would anyone at this point deny that there is some Satan, something that I, I shouldn't say anyone, because a lot of people would deny it. But it, it also seems definitely a possibility that we have now, through our collective consciousness, created exactly what we've talked about for the last 2,000 years, and people have put all this energy into, and films have been created about, and all that stuff. So are we co-creators of this reality, and how do we pull that out of this whole thing? Well, I mean, yeah, that's definitely something you have to consider. I mean, I don't know that everyone who signed on to this believed that, but I mean, I do certainly think that there were some people in very senior levels of the government and the intelligence community that did come to believe very much that we could create our own realities by manifesting these beliefs on a popular enough level in the public at large. I mean, it is a, a fascinating concept, but I mean, you know, too, though, it also begs the question, is it just any individual or is it specific individuals as well? I mean, I don't know. I'm sure you probably read American Cosmos, right? Um, that's sort of a book where they get into some of these notions about possibly there being genetic, um, you know, some kind of genetic uh, code or something like that for people who experience high strangeness and that type of thing. I mean, I'll tell you something really weird that sort of relates to this. Okay, so I'm working on this podcast right now, Kenny Royal, which is affiliated with uh, the Hell Your Show that's on Amazon and whatnot, paranormal type thing and whatnot. So I had a lot of strange meetings with the guys who do this, the Penny Royal guys, through a series of synchronicities and whatnot. But um, in talking to them, I figured out that uh, all three of us have been tested uh, as gifted children. And that's interesting to me because gifted uh, testing essentially looks for students that have unusual high abilities for pattern recognition, seeing different things that aren't usually evident uh, to people in different disciplines and so forth. So you get people like us involved in something like this, and it does kind of beg the question, well, is this kind of making the whole experience that we're having looking into these things even stranger? Because we have had a lot of that, you know, different leads and researches. I mean, I know just talking to the Penny Royal guys, they start looking at this area they pick up on one cult possibly being active here. And then after studying it for almost two years, there's like half a dozen cults that they've found. So at some point we have sort of stepped back and have wondered, were all these cults really here before we started looking at it? Or who knows, you know? But I mean, it is a strange thing. And I do, you know, I try to sit in the fence as much as this as I possibly can. But on the flip side of the coin, I've had so many strange experiences with this that I have to wonder on some level how much belief really does manifest the reality that we live in. And specifically, is it also particular individuals who are manipulated in the beliefs who have a higher capacity to influence this type of thing as artists or, you know, any other type of medium? I don't really know, but it is very strange. See, that's a super interesting question, isn't it? And that's kind of a next level question, um, which is, I'm going to say next level to me, what that means is once you get past the idea that we're co-creators of this reality, right? Which you can sit there and wrestle someone back and forth, but screw that. Just take that as a given and now start asking the questions that you're asking, which is just an awesome opening question. Are some people more effective at manifesting a consensus reality that we can all experience than other people? Wow, what an interesting question. And then you, you tied it into another question there is that, you know, so you had certain traits when you were born and they called them gifted. Is there possibly a genetic tie to that correlation to that? Um, and do multiple people share that genetic makeup if we were able to look at it, which again, to me, you know, we can't avoid the, uh, the ET UFO thing. And it always surprises me when that doesn't come into these conversations because it's so front and center. I don't know how we're leaving it out. So one of the things I pinged you with 
beforehand uh, because we're going to talk about this. And I, I don't know where you're at on this, so I thought it'd be interesting. But I interviewed UFO researcher Grant Cameron. I've interviewed him several times. I kind of pissed him off the last time, so I don't know if we'll do it again. But he's done some fantastic work over the years. But one of the things that he did that always stuck with me is he, along with the late, great uh, Stanton Friedman, who recently passed away, did a Freedom of Information Act in Canada. And it's kind of like, I, I'm sure you've done a lot of FOIA requests. I have not. But, you know, every once in a while, you get a little gem that just pops up. And these guys got a gem when the Wilbert Smith memo was released. And Wilbert Smith was kind of running the strange desk in Canada, if you will, at the time in the 50s. So this is where all the supposedly just radio waves and stuff were thing. But he was also getting all the UFO reports. So the weirdness, this, I mean, those were the guys specifically tasked, I think really was trying to understand a lot of this phenomenon in the first place. I mean, that in itself is very significant. Absolutely. And, and so I'm just going to retell this story for the benefit of the audience, even though a lot of people listen to the show have heard it 50 times before. But Wilbert Smith is there. And so he starts collecting all the, the reports are landing on his desk and eventually he goes to his boss and he goes, we got to figure, you know, something's going on here. How about, you know, we go talk to the Yanks and see what they know. And so he goes, yeah, let's do it. So he starts sharing stuff. And that's probably the only reason they let him in the tent down here in the United States is he st sh st shared some shit and they were like, whoa, come on down. You got some good stuff that we want too. So he goes down and he meets all the, the right people, Band of Our Bush. And, you know, he names names in this secret memo that is later released. But the other thing he releases in this memo, which ties back to... I guess the cybernetics, MK Ultra, you know, what these guys were really up to thing. He said, he, the, the, to not bury the lead, his memo is that UFO thing is real, ET is real, it is the highest, most important, most secret secret that the US has, higher than the hydrogen bomb. So imagine in the 50s, this is like, say higher than the hydrogen bomb, you're up there. But then in the last pit, uh, sentence what these guys picked up on is that that has something to do with a mental phenomenon. Now, that catapults us into a different kind of space. What it says is that they had made contact with ET and made contact at this telepathic level, although we're not even sure that that's the right word for it. But in this extended realm, they had connected with ET and that they believed that it was necessary to better understand that extended realm because this was both a threat and an opportunity, like these guys always look at everything. And uh, so Grant's view is, and, and really my, I've kind of pushed this, is that that has to be factored into the equation with MKUltra, that that had to be maybe one of the agendas in terms of we got to figure this out because we're already talking to ET and we ain't talking through them through no radio. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, again, you know, my kind of working theory on the, uh, the obsession with the UFO phenomenon sort of ties into what we've been discussing about um, belief potentially manifesting reality. See, there were two really excellent books that were written by um, James Carrion, I believe his name is. One is The Rosetta Deception, and the other one is The Roswell Deception. And he does a really great job of uh, laying out how some of these early UFO encounters were effectively uh, deception operations that the U.S. and the U.K. were running. And specifically with the ghost rocket flap that you had in the uh, Scandinavian countries in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War, basically to convinced the Soviets that there were these, you know, super weapons, this extraterrestrial race and what have you around so that they would, you know, invest tons of money looking into this. And I know that sounds outlandish, but this is the type of thing that we really did throughout the Cold War. I mean, the Strategic Defense Initiative, for instance, we never really thought would work. It was just a way to get the Soviets to waste money. Okay, so we're doing all these deception operations and at the highest levels of government, you know, we know these things aren't real, right? But then I think something happened that really shook everybody they actually started to appear. Nobody had any idea why they were showing up. 
because they weren't supposed to exist. We knew that they weren't supposed to exist. And this was roughly right around the time when you start seeing all these projects initiating, Chatter, Bluebird, uh, the early ones initially with the Navy and then going into the MK Ultra stuff and so forth. And it's also when a lot of these weird desks started to show up too, which were never designed to just look at the UFO stuff, but all kinds of unusual and unexplainable phenomena, essentially kind of X-Files divisions for each you know, major branch of US intelligence services. So you realize essentially that something exists now that's not supposed to exist. And probably one of the most logical explanations would have been is that belief had factored into it. I mean, this was already something that you were starting to see currents prop up in psychology and so forth. So, I mean, the next step from there probably would have been logically to see if you could actually contact it. I mean, why not, right? And if you're already doing it through all these kind of kooky means, you know, going into stuff about belief manifesting things, well, who would be the people who would best understand how to rationalize this and contact something like that? Well, magicians, you know, they had already been talking a lot about how belief could be used to manifest reality for a long time now. So that's when I think you start seeing all these weird characters get brought in. I mean, you have guys like Adrena Puharic, um, the guy who had channeled the nine, the so-called seance that changed the world, was put onto that path by a cyberneticist. So I think that's sort of where we got into some of this stuff. Could we also contact these, you know, so-called non-human intelligence or what have you? See, the, the problem I have with that is I think that the evidence for the ancient alien theory, for lack of a better term, and a lot of people hate that because they hate the show. I don't hate on the show. I think the show really kind of did a lot of good but and does a lot of good. But I think the evidence for that really stacks up to the point of being overwhelming, particularly when you go to um, cross culture, cross time, you know, and you go and you, you look at these tribes in Africa that have no contact with the outside world and don't have a written language and say, yeah, you know, and they're wearing the headgear and the spacesuits and they're pointing to the Pleiades and saying, well, yeah, 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 yeah. And I don't necessarily think that it does discount prior contact with the same entities either before, you know, the Cold War era. But see, something else I'll point out with that as well. When you get into these early deception operations, they grew out of um, a lot of the British efforts and what have you that were organized around the, the political warfare executive and so forth. And, you know, a lot of the guys involved in that were people like, uh, what's his name, Ronald Dahl, Ian Fleming. Um, people that were in contact with a lot of Crowleyites or people that knew a lot of prominent occultists who were initially tapped with doing these deception operations. It kind of begs the question, where were they always magical workings in the first place and their superiors had no idea that they were? I mean, certainly this is also concurrent around the same time that Jack Parsons is out there doing the Babylon working and so forth. So, I mean, I don't, I personally don't think the belief alone is what manifested the things. I think that they definitely have existed prior to that. Because it's like I fast forward to, um, have you read uh, Diana Walsh Pasolka's book, American Cosmic? Oh, yeah. So did you do a show? Have you ever talked to her? No, no, I would like to at some point. I've been talking to her agent about that for a little bit now. Yeah, you know, she was doing, she did an interview with me back when she was doing more interviews. And then I think she got, you know, kind of interview weary a little bit, which we understand. And, you know, maybe she'll come back around and, and, and that kind of stuff. But... Uh, that book to me is phenomenal in so many ways. And, you know, one of the things that this is like a total side to me, but it's like so critical. She's Catholic, you know, and she was still mm. Catholic. And they kind of a, not a strict Catholic and kind of very open-minded and a really, uh, tenured professor in religious studies. So she's not like, you know, strictly religious person. But the fact that she's out in the desert finding crashed alien space junk that is being reverse engineered directly into multi-million dollar patents that her Gucci wearing buddy is flying around on private jets kind of drives a stake in the ground in terms of the reality of this stuff uh, because money does that you know when someone's cashing in that much just from the junk and it mm -hmm. also drives a stake in the ground in terms of, I don't know, something akin to a breakaway civilization, at least a breakaway academia, where there are some people who are in the know on this, and then there's just a bunch of other people who are just completely ignorant of it. And 
most importantly, those are the people that we normally would go to to say, is this stuff real? And, you know, it, in a way, it ties back to the very first question that I guess I was driving at with you, Recluse, is that to me, the kind of research you're doing, the parapolitical research, is the new standard for how to know. Because if you do have this uh, breakaway academia, you're never going, you, they, they, that's a fight club kind of situation, right? The first rule of fight yeah, clubs yeah. don't, so the first we'll rule of breakaway right. academia yeah. is don't tell anyone. And then, so the rest of the a academia is completely useful idiot kind of vill where, where they don't know anything. So where do we turn? We, it all comes to you, buddy. I mean, we all come back to you and say, okay, so tell us what's really going on the best you can. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's, you know, is in essence what I've been trying to do, and especially looking into a lot of this, you know, these strange currents, so to speak, um, because, I mean, it really is crucial. I mean, this is where the real cutting edge science uh, is happening. And again, I always want to emphasize, you know, um, I'm not saying that I necessarily believe that a lot of this stuff is possible, but there are certainly some very powerful and very well uh, connected individuals who do think that it's possible and have invested a lot of time and resources into it. And it's just instrumental to try to reconstruct this as much as we possibly can to try to understand the true history of what's really been happening, especially for the last 50 or 60 years, because it's so instrumental to what is now unfolding to a, a, for us right now in our modern society. So let's talk, let's talk a little bit about right now modern society as it relates to your new book. That's a cue for me to put it up there on the screen. A Special Relationship, Trump, Epstein, and the Secret History of the Anglo-American Establishment. D go over one more time as I show kind of the table of contents here, where you're trying to take us with this book. And then, and I know you're big on tracing the history, but come up, bring us up to speed on right now, how you think this plays out with what we're experiencing real time, like just the debates last night, you know, the third debate. I mean, this stuff is oh, right, we're right in the middle of it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, really, I think that the network I'm chronicling here was at the heart of, um, you know, uh, Brexit in the UK and the rise of Trump. Explain that. Okay. Well, I mean, essentially, okay, you have the Second World War that ends and you end up with a lot of these spooks who were temporarily unemployed. And this sort of created this vast network of private intelligence networks among the U.S. and the U.K. that have really subsisted uh, to this very day. Now, of course, the U.K. was always a lot more reliant on this network because they weren't a great power, essentially, in the Cold War era. They had to do things with much more plausible deniability than we did in the U.S. here. But uh, that's changing as well as America's overall power starts to decline. But, I mean, this is where, like, the private military sector comes from, especially, which is one of the things that I chronicle in the first book, the rise of the modern-day PMCs. And this is the sort of legacy that if you fast forward to 2020, where what I kind of think of as the Cambridge Analytica network comes from, you know what I'm saying? You guys did a great show on fourth-generation warfare, and that's what I think you're alluding to here. And it's such a great point, but a lot of people probably aren't, tuned into it until that you tell them, you know, but you just kind of think it through, you know, you're out there battling with sticks and swords and it's like whoever has the most sticks and the best swords wins. And then you get guns and you're like, well, whoever has the best guns and planes wins. And then you get nuclear bombs and you're like, oh shit, well, we can't really do that yeah, anymore. Yeah. All along you were doing the information game, the information war at every stage you were doing that. But now it kind of shifts, right? And now that becomes, well, really the, the, the tool that is gaining more power is the information aspect. And it also becomes the most viable one to kind of bring to the, to the battlefield. So that shift that you're talking about is so freaking central to all this. And I just want to make sure that, that it, it's your point. I just want to make sure that we- Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it's the shift with that, but I mean, it's also, I think, the shift of a lot of this stuff going from the public to the private as well, too, which is also instrumental in how things are currently playing out right now. 
And I mean, it was kind of like the same thing with the outsourcing of the private military industry as well, because I mean, it was so central around special operations forces. So now it's a situation where, you know, you only need a handful of soldiers to do what you used to need, you know, a couple of battalions to do, uh, you know, a couple of decades ago. And now, I mean, going into the 21st century, it's the same thing with psychological warfare operations. You know, you used to need, used to need a whole staff to do this. Now, I mean, you need a couple of guys with keyboards effectively. So now, I mean, a relatively small network of private actors can, you know, effectively do tremendous damage to sovereign states. I mean, we're seeing it right here in the United States. You know, they're seeing it in the UK with Brexit. And I think if you really pull back the curtain, there probably aren't a lot of people who were, you know, uh, per, who are players in this, who are parts of this. Independent to whether or not it reflects the quote unquote will of the people. Right. No, it doesn't. I mean, they're right. doing this totally for private agendas, essentially. Right, right. But sometimes, sometimes it reflects the will of the people. So it's still being engineered. It's still being gamed, but it's being gamed. I guess we could argue or have to hash out whether it is a, 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 a virtuous game because it really is the people and it's countering a force that was trying to subvert the will of the people. It's kind of like I just did the show on, you know, the Gloria Steinem thing and how she was a CIA op from the beginning and not just, uh, uh, she, she wasn't at all interested in the women's movement, you know, other than she was just a CIA girl that was out doing things at the, for student protests and stuff like that. And they recruited her for this job. And it's like, the, the problem with that is that we needed that nudge of, you know, it was pretty unfair in terms of how our laws were in our society wasn't coming along in terms of equal rights for women. So it'd be easy to embrace that and say, well, by any means necessary. But on the other hand, do we really want the CIA you know, behind that running the running that program? And I'd say the same thing here, you know. So if Brexit really does reflect the will of the people, some people could say, well, then that's a good thing because they were holding us down in terms of controlling all the information so that that couldn't be expressed. But then you're still in this dilemma because you're still in a manipulation situation. Do you, do you get what I mean? What do you think about all yeah, that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, because again, you know, it's just, we don't really have any legitimate gr uh, grassroots anymore. I mean, it's all exactly. like astroturfing and so forth. And that is really especially what is so dangerous about something like Cambridge. I mean, that's really what they do. I mean, they create false movements. They try to encourage people to not vote. I mean, just all this other kind of shady stuff that does manipulate the public will so much. And, you know, we're still, I think, really unaware of how all of this affects us. And again, that's why, I mean, you see this small group of private actors who are able to subvert the government of the most powerful nation on earth, allegedly. Yes, exactly. And, uh, you know, I tell you what, let me, there's, again, there's just so many things and, and hopefully we'll have an ongoing discussion about this. And I know I'm, I'm going to come on the farm and I, I would love for that appearance just to be kind of round two of this, because this is the stuff I really think is it's just so great. And so next level, which you're able to do because you have this immense database now connected in your head of all these different facts that a lot of people don't have a handle on. But I wanted to talk about New World Order for a minute. And I, I kind of have to throw you a little bit of a curveball here. And I, I kind of wish I would have sent you this in advance. But I did an interview, I don't know, a couple years ago with this guy. And he's a political sci professor at Ohio State University and really well respected. His name is uh, Dr. Alexander Went. You ever heard of him? I believe so. You Sounds might. Familiar. As the story goes on, you, you might have heard him because you wrote these couple of papers that really got a lot of traction inside of the alternative conspiratorial community. And both of them are super interesting. And these things just, just about cost him his job and certainly cost him a lot of respectability among his peers. But, you know, he's a German guy and kind of had this kind of certain thing where he was kind of a Teflon, like, what are you talking about? I'm just writing another poli sci paper. What are you all worked up about? But here is the point, not to bury it. The first paper was, well, one world government. Yeah, if you really think about it, of course. Yeah, how can it be otherwise? We're headed towards a one world government. Look at the long lens of history. You know, you start with all these little tribes and all these little states, and then they consolidate, you know, as you were kind of saying, is power gets, gets more consolidated, then the states get more consolidated. And sure, that's where we're heading. And as kind of 
somewhat obvious as that is, it is a bit of a game changer when you really step back and go, ooh, so what is the game that's really be playing? Because if this guy can figure it out, then there's a lot of other smart people can figure that out and say, so we're all really heading towards New World Order, One World, uh, one world kind of thing. We really don't like the way it's being pushed by the Orwellian uh, left-wing crowd. But as you kind of have delved into in the last couple of shows you've done on the farm is there's another force and it's not so clear that in the, their end game isn't New World Order, One World State either because they see around the curve and they see that that's probably happening. And yeah. uh, let's, just, let's just throw that out. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, everybody sort of knows the sort of globalist, internationalist version of a new world order, so to speak. But I mean, you had this sort of counter vision, uh, which in the American experience really went back to uh, the administration of William McKinley, uh, which was really instrumental, which is why nobody talks about it. But um, you had an individual in that administration who uh, went by the name of Theodore Roosevelt, who was effectively America's first neocon. Now, Roosevelt was, of course, a major internationalist. Um, he was a big believer in manifest destiny, radical racist, all kinds of wonderful things. Anyway, he also wanted America to embrace internationalism. But more than anything, he wanted a great, and glorious American empire that would dominate the world and effectively would model the world after our values. And that was really at the crux of always uh, this sort of dispute between the different elite factions. You're sort of conservative and internationalist on the one hand and you're globalist on the other hand. Basically, were we going to try to go towards a world government that would have at least nominally attempted to be more inclusive? And in fairness to the old guard, you know, Eastern establishment elites as vile as they were in many ways, I mean, I do think that in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War, there was something of an effort to try and do something that would be more inclusive to the rest of the peoples of the world. Than I like your qualifications guy. there. I think those qualifications are uh, key. <laughs> But um, on the other hand, I mean, there was just always a group that always effectively wanted this America first vision. I mean, later it sort of came to also incorporate the UK in it and essentially this sort of great Anglo-American empire that would dominate the entire world. And effectively, I mean, they are both uh, internationalist visions of it. But I mean, I think uh, the more utopian one, quote unquote, if you will, at least managed through the UN and what have you, was attempting to do so more so in a long time period of war of adoration, you know, kind of wearing everybody down and gradually bringing them into this sector. Whereas the Rooseveltian version was definitely a much more militant one. It was more than willing to try to bring about this great glorious empire by the sword, if that's what it took. And I think you really see that, especially very much in this day and age with, a, you know, a lot of the rise of the neocons, the American firsters and the American right and so forth. And it's really unsettling because, I mean, again, you know, going back to the old, you know, kind of anglo American Eastern establishment in the U.S., the Rockefellers and all these people, I mean, they had seen the Second World War firsthand. They knew the kinds of weapons that were being developed, and they understood that there were at least certain lines that we should never cross because otherwise there wouldn't be a human species left, essentially. Yeah, and, as you explored in a recent uh, episode on the farm and, and did so, just really in this kind of deep nuanced way, you get to end of that discussion and you're like, well, if I am gonna be dragged into the gutter in, in a fight, then I do have to fight. So it's not like, and that's the, the problem with all this stuff is it, it just degrades, you know, into who's ever the nastiest wins out. So it, it's not like one side, if we are engaged in this culture war battle that, that is the manifestation of this deeper battle, ideological battle of what the new world order is going to look like. Because that's what we're saying here, I guess. We're saying that there's two visions for the eventuality of that one world state, the inevitability of that one world state that my buddy Alexander Went is pointing to. And the one vision is what we're seeing manifested by kind of, let's call it the, the left, um, then the, the counter to that, especially the way they're playing the game, is 
what you're talking about on the right, but it really can't be any other way. It's kind of like the, the, the Christian thing, which we can maybe get into religion and stuff like that. And I think we're actually being dragged into a false duality with this, though. I mean, I, I mean, essentially, I would say we need a third option, you know, because neither one of these are really very good ones. I mean, I think that, the, you know, the globalist one might be somewhat a little better in some levels. I mean, probably less people would die, but it's not pretty either. A lot of levels either, let's just say that. So... I mean, I think that we need, you know, to start looking at different possibilities because, yes, the world is going to become interconnected. I mean, even more so than it is now. I mean, that's inevitable with the way technology is going and so forth. But that also gives us, you know, the ability to not need, I think, as many of these Byzantine uh, structures over us, be they, you know, a kind of all-seeing world government or multinational corporations that effectively have the power of multiple But do you think the center can really hold? This is the point that you guys raised in your in this show, and I forget which episode it, it was because you've had so many fantastic ones that they've all kind of merged ahead in my merged together. Well, you asking me, my, do I think uh, society is going to survive essentially? Well, but no, because I, I think. And where is the farm here? Um, Oh, because I want to show people some of the episodes that you've had here. I, I, you know, there, there's always, you know, oh, will society survive and all the rest of this. It's like, you know, what I'm saying is kind of a more, and this is, again, this is, I think, the point that you guys were talking about is like, if you want to say, I don't want to take sides, there has to be another way, you know, kind of what's popularized by the alternative, uh, the alt-alt media that we're a part of, I just look at that and I just, have to kind of laugh a little bit. It seems so naive a little bit. I mean, the amount of money and power that these other two forces have is just going to, it makes it look ridiculous. So yeah, you know, everyone wants to, everyone wants to pick on Soros and his billions that he's putting into that one side of the agenda. And as you guys so rightly point out, it was like, well, there's billions coming in on the other side and they're trying to co-op things and manage things on the other side. But the idea that, and again, I, I, I hate to be the Debbie Downer here, but the, the mm -hmm. idea that there's going to be this organic middle that will kind of rise up, it's like, no, to whatever extent we are successful, it will be in making a small dent in shifting one of those two polarities. It's not a third leg on the stool, it just ain't going to happen. We don't have enough power, we don't have enough money. Well, I mean, yes and no. I mean, I do think, though, with the rise of the change in communications, though, that does offer different possibilities that we really haven't had uh, in human history up to this point in time. I mean, obviously, that could all change if there is an attempt to massively crack down on the Internet or something to that effect. But I mean, crack down, uh, buddy. I mean, this is again. So, so again, I, I'm not, I'm not like trying to, to, to pick on no, you. You're fine. You're fine. You're fine. Because, because what I'm doing, what I'm doing is really pushing back with your own points, you know, that you've made. Because, and, and if you weren't uh, exploring both sides of this, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't have the respect that I do for you because you're, uh, we all are flip-flopping on all this stuff. So uh, Cambridge Analytica is, to your point, is a few guys that are running this game that it is impossible for us to, right? It took us forever to figure out that that's what was going on. Well, they've already moved on to the next level, next level, next level. So for us to get all excited because we have, uh, have the internet and we can podcast and we can talk to each other, hey, I'm not putting that down. I'm still doing it. I mean, it doesn't mean that, that, to, that you stop doing it, oh, in, but it does mean that you have to kind of check yourself in terms of how this fits into kind of the big picture. I mean, I just talked to, you know, the, the cancel culture, the, the people that are just kind of disappeared, you know, completely from the conversation. This is something we never would have even, if you and I were having this conversation five years ago and one of us said that, the other one would be, you're nuts. Never, they could never do that. They could never completely just across all these platforms. It shows this collusion. This talk about conspiracy shows this compromised cons uh, conspiratorial collusion that we could never imagine. We would have never anticipated that they could have done that. Now we live it. So again, I, I just I think you're I think you're e equally on board with that at different times as I am. But then you also want to kind of look at the bright side of things that. Yeah, we yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, also, I always I hate to tell people to try to support the lesser of two evils in any real faction. I mean, I don't know. I feel like that's a lot of what has led us to this sad juncture. I mean, we've just 
we've continuously lowered our standards generation after generation after generation. And it's, well, you can see, just look at the presidential debate we were uh, forced to witness last night. I mean, that's what it's gotten us now. <laughs> Well, I think, it, 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 well, I don't want to get off on another tangent. I think politics, when you look at them, are really interesting because, and, and you have a little bit of that lens. I mean, when you go back to uh, uh, McKinley or whatever, I mean, there were some really nasty shit going on in our history that makes modern politics look mild compared to what those guys did and all that. So it's always been, why wouldn't you? You know, if you can't, it's a great, it's like the whole, and not to, Nick Bostrom, which is a fantastic philosopher from uh, uh, Oxford and is kind of better yeah, known right. for, yeah. So, you know, if they can, they will, it is one of the quotes I like from him. And it's like, no matter how horrific you think, you know, whatever it is, whether it's transhumanism or, you know, genetic engineering or, you know, cloning, whatever, it, technologically, if we can, we will. It's just always been. And, the, and you can't get away from it by being a, a Luddite and sticking your head in the ground and go, well, you know, we just got, uh, we just got in our house the new uh, virtual <laughs> reality thing from Facebook, you know. Cause <laughs> it's like, you, you, as soon as you do that, you're like, well, of course, everyone's going to be doing this. Everyone's going to be fighting over, deciding how much of their life is virtual versus how much life is non-virtual. It's, it's a given. If you think that isn't going to happen, it's going to happen for the largest percentage of the population. It's just like, um, you know, the neural link stuff and, and all that, you know, I mean, of, of course I, I have a family member very close to me who has uh, epilepsy. They're not going to sign up for the neural link. If it stops their seizures, of course they will. Well, now you're in the game, right? Because, hey, you know what else we can do with this neural link? We can do this and this and this and this. Do you want any of this? Or you want to shut that down? You know, I mean, it's like, of course we're heading there. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it's definitely, you know, I mean, it's a strange position to be in, certainly. And I mean, but I mean, that's really essentially a big part of why I do what I do, because I mean, how they're applied and I mean, effectively how they can be used against the different factions as well. I mean, I think, you know, if you really look at some of these more arcane groups, I mean, what was it, the DKMU, was it Dominus Chaotis Marauder Underground or some of these other kind of outfits, they're already trying to do something like that, you know? I mean, I think that's really, at this point in time, the best bet that we really have. You know, what I think that we really have, and I always say this, and people think I'm joking or something, is, you know, the, the old Navy commercials, you know, a force for good. They show this big... <laughs> aircraft carrier no it's global shot. force for good oh yeah that, that's you're so right buddy that's so right 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 we're close it's like they've changed it now right <laughs> Talk yeah. about the programming but the old one which is just generic right i mean whether it's global or whether it's national let's leave that out of the debate but let's be a force for good let's uh you know tie into the american ideals that we were never their ideals we never lived them really but we at least had those ideals that's mm -hmm. all i think we have to do is just try and be a force for good in our life in our community in the people that we come in contact with oh and absolutely that's the you strong know, and that's the gravitational force that's what pulls these two polarized insanities you know, need to be attracted to us rather than us try and glom onto them. What do you think about that as we try and... Well, absolutely. And I mean, I think specifically, you know, to put these techniques to a positive end and so forth, because I mean, to a certain extent, you know, you do need these psychological constructs to formulate a society. I mean, you need a certain mythos to base a society around. I mean, they really don't last if they don't have that. And I mean, I think it's really up to us, I mean, especially artists, political scholars, that type of thing, to create a mythos that is a positive one, something that's more inclusive, something that's going to be for the betterment of humanity in the long run. Awesome. You know what? I think that's a good way to kind of round it on home. What else do we need to share with people in terms of how they need to uh, connect with what you're doing and, and, and keep keep up to speed on how to make that good stuff happen. 
Well, I mean, I just think, you know, you need to step back sometimes. I mean, even though I am kind of a political junkie, I mean, I usually make a point, you know, at least a couple of hours a day really to just get outside or something, just get away from all the technology and I mean, the insanity and just try to focus on what's really important to me in my life. I mean, that's kind of another thing, you know, you need something to aspire towards goals and just ultimately realize that there is stuff that you can do. I mean, it just seems like talking to, because I'm a cook professionally, I don't really do anything prestigious or anything. I'm around normal people pretty regularly. It just seems like people get so daunted by thinking that I, I'm just a little person. I can't really do anything constructive. I'm like, well, it's just nonsense. You know, you really just have to believe in yourself. You know, the other thing that you said there that I think is kind of interesting and people don't talk about a lot and it almost sounds, it can sound a little bit patronizing when you say I'm around normal people a lot, but I know exactly what you mean. And I find that too. I mean, people have to also, I think, step out of their social structures too, because it just seems like so often people only want to, you know, especially nowadays, we only want to associate with other liberals or we only want to associate with other conservatives or we only want to associate with other vegans or that type of thing. I mean, at least for me, I've always tried to have friends from very different backgrounds over the course of my life. And I mean, I think that's very useful. You know, it exposes you to different social structures. And a big part, I think, of being, you know, trying to do positive things in the world is understanding other people's perspectives. I mean, even if you find them appalling, you really can't help them get beyond their perspectives if you don't understand where they're coming from. You know, it just seems like in general, there's a a lack of mutual understanding nowadays in our society and attempt to even try to get where the other person is coming from. You know, you need to emphasize ultimately with other people to help them. Awesome. Well, again, folks, we've been talking to Steven Schneider, AKA recluse. Fantastic stuff. I hope you got a taste of it without getting too overwhelmed. Check out his podcast. It's just terrific long form, but deep, deep dives into stuff. Um, Strange Tales of the Parapolitical, but we're going to want you to go to his website to catch that. Where did I do it? The website. He's got a new book, A Special Relationship, that you can get from the website, as well as his other book on the parapolitical. So it's been absolutely terrific having you on, Recluse, and uh, look forward to doing it again. Yep. Thanks a lot, Alex. Boom. Thanks again to Steven Snyder, a.k.a. Recluse, for joining me today on Skeptico. The one question I guess I tee up from this interview is the one that we kind of reached at the end of this, and that is, is there a third option in this globalist, global warming, communist one side and crazy right wing, moony, uh, neocon or die alternative on the other? Is there a third way, a middle way, and how do we find it? I guess that's the question I tee up. Can't get any bigger than that one, really. So if you liked this interview, if you enjoyed it, I thought it was a great conversation. I have another one coming up with uh, Recluse on his show. That'll be out pretty soon. Check that out. I've been doing a number of interviews on other shows, and I continue to have some pretty good ones coming up on Skeptico as well. So stay with me for all of that. Until next time, take care and bye for now.